Hey everyone, my name is Dan Sykes, and for this playlist, we're going to be covering um, my lectures for the sophomore level analytical chemistry course, or also known as quantitative analysis. I'll be stepping down, uh, teaching that course uh, after this semester, and the uh, new faculty member who will be taking over uh, has requested that I record some of these lectures um, so that they can look back and see some of the content that I was covering. Um, I also want to do it just because I've been teaching it for uh, almost 20 years now, and uh, just to kind of have a record of what I'm currently doing uh, in this uh, course. Um, we did try and uh, videotape uh, these lectures within the course itself during the class setting, but I move around quite a bit uh, throughout the classroom. I have PowerPoints. Uh, up and I also write on the chalkboard quite a bit. Uh, and the additional constraint on all of that, besides just trying to capture all of that, is that we have to blur uh, the students' faces. Um, and that is really distracting on these videos. So we've decided uh, that we're just going to record these uh, videos in my office. There might be uh, an opportunity to record some of these videos uh, in the classroom. Uh, due to special circumstances as we move forward. But uh, essentially, uh, these videos will be essentially what I do in the classroom uh, sans any communication I have with the students. Uh, I tend to ask students you know, questions quite a bit in class. Uh, we work on problems together as I'm lecturing. Um, we move at the pace of the students, uh, their ability to uh, answer these questions in real time by you know, plugging in numbers in their calculator, et cetera. Uh, and there are some lectures where we just work on problems and there's, uh, I'm not directing anything. Uh, we're moving around uh, the individual groups within the class that students are broken up into and answer uh, questions and, and guide them along, et cetera. Those will not be recorded. So only those where I am, uh, there is some component of me standing up in front of the class, uh, talking to the students, working with them, interacting with them. So there's usually no just formal lecture. There's usually a lot of communication interaction. Uh, while we're doing this. So when it slows me down, but also the students are thinking through the concepts and, and the equations, et cetera, as we're, as we're discussing them. Um, and then, of course, we also have a lecture just entirely devoted to students working on problems where myself and the LAs and TAs uh, go around and, you know, and, and help mentor and guide the students through those as well. So um, not as uh, maybe as dynamic and uh, uh, broken up a little bit as if we were uh, filming live, but uh, hopefully this will suffice and uh, maybe provide you with some uh, ideas for approaching some of the concepts in this type of course or some things not to do uh, when you're essentially teaching this course. Okay, so I am going to begin with um, the first introduction. So, you know, the syllabus a day. Uh, I really don't talk about the syllabus all that much. Um, well, I do. Well, you'll see. Um, and uh, so I'm going to share my screen uh, so you can see the PowerPoints, but there'll be on occasion sometimes when I take it off share screen. Um, so it'll be important to do so. Uh, so it'll be back and forth, it'll maybe a little disruptive to the flow of it, uh, but we'll see how it works. Okay, so I'm going to share my screen. Let's see, I'm going to go right there, share, and I'm going to go to the slideshow. And from the current slide. And we'll hide these controls for now. Okay, so um, we're in analytical chemistry here at Penn State, is known as Chem 227. We tend to use numbers rather than the actual titles of these. Uh, and so when we talk about analytical chemistry, analytical chemistry is really kind of an overarching umbrella. And within that umbrella or under that umbrella, uh, we have a number of different uh, types of uh, industry positions or academia positions that are uh, folded into that umbrella. So this would be anybody working in a clinical laboratory environment or interested in working in a clinical lab in, uh, environment, a crime or forensic lab, drug lab, environmental pharmaceutical and toxicology labs. So these um, are uh, traditional in industry uh, kind of positions or areas of industry where analytical chemistry uh, is important and where analytical chemists uh, find employment. Um, so what I have here is essentially a definition of modern analytical chemistry. And this is uh, taken from, uh, in part, 
uh, several different sources. I didn't really like the, what the definition was on the uh, ACS website for analytical chemistry. Uh, so I took some of that content, but also added some other content as well. Uh, there are two main areas of modern analytical chemistry, right? And uh, you'll find this in the different flavors of these courses because uh, some institutions are going to have analytical chemistry as a combined course, which bridges traditional quantitative analysis and instrumental analysis. Some will have separate courses like we do. Um, and, uh, but the goal here is you know, uh, discovery. Uh, and we'll look at that at the first real uh, PowerPoint uh, lecture that we have. So it's essentially you know, what is in this matrix and uh, how much is in this particular matrix and what do we have to do to a sample to extract the analyte or analytes of interest so that we can actually put them into the instrument. Now, I can't just take mud and put it into an instrument. It just doesn't work that way. So uh, traditional analytical chemistry quantitative analysis, what do I have to do to transform the sample uh, so, I can, so that the analytes are then contained in the matrix or transformed into a matrix that is compatible with the instrumentation. Okay, and then the second part of that is, well, what instruments do I use to essentially characterize the analyte or analytes or the chemical processes taking place? And uh, if it doesn't exist, what do I, what, what modifications do I have to make to existing instruments or what new instruments do I need to build to essentially observe chemical systems uh, in the way that I want like to, to observe them? Um, so those are the two aspects of it. So there's an important, essentially, uh, sample transformation and quantitation part of it, and then an instrumentation part of it, which isn't just using existing instrumentation, but you know, creating new instruments or modifying existing instruments to characterize chemical systems in ways we couldn't do before. Um, analytical R&D units for those, because we, we have a lot of students interested in pharmaceuticals, drug development, et cetera. Well, the analytical R&D units are really the largest employment area in the pharmaceutical sector. Because uh, once you have a potential drug target, everything between you know, identifying that, which includes analytical and physical and inorganic and organic and synthetic organic chemistry, physical organic chemistry, really combines all of that. But once you have that drug target, everything you have to do to that to get it to essentially commercialization is really analytical. And that includes the clinical trials and you know, all the tests on you know, what is out of administration, how much uh, shelf life, all that stuff is embedded into the analytical aspect of that. So uh, in this course, uh, what we're looking at here, uh, and uh, this will be on the next page, is uh, the topics that we're going to be discussing are here. And I think I'm, this is going to be here. Um, so. Uh, we're, look, we're going to be looking at a number of different uh, topics. And our first topic will be methods of quantitation. Uh, we do discuss statistics in this course, but statistics is mainly uh, within the laboratory environment. So students in this course work in groups of two. And there's 16 students per lab section, so there are eight groups. And so you're not only responsible for your own group's data, but you're responsible for every group's data within your lab section. This way we can discuss uh, statistics. And so uh, we discussed that wholly within uh, the laboratory environment so that students are using their own data to uh, learn statistics and how to manipulate data and, and compare data between different groups and different lab sections and different instruments that we're using. So uh, in lecture, we're going to start out with methods of quantitation because essentially you know, what we're trying to do is transform uh, a sample uh, to a form that's compatible with an instrument so that we can determine how much of a given analyte or analyte is present. So methods of quantitation are important. Um, and then we look at spectroscopy. That'll be the next subject, the, the second concept we address in the course. And, uh, and that's because for the most part, you know, we're probing chemical systems uh, with electromagnetic radiation and looking at how we respond to those probes. And so it's important to understand you know, the basis of, those, of that probe and, and how it's uh, how we're using it and how it interacts with the sample. And so those are our first two topics. And then we go to acid base equilibrium complexation in electrochemistry, because we're going to be using these core concepts in chemistry to transform our sample. So it's not just learning acid base chemistry and complexation which we learn them, but how do we use them to transform samples into a form that we can put into an instrument. So it's contextualized with respect to sample preparation. Uh, and then also, what are some of the information we can gather or gain uh, about a chemical system using these techniques as well? And then our final topic is chromatography. 
uh, which uh, is kind of a lead into the uh, 400 level instrument analysis course in electrochemistry and chromatography. And we just look at the fundamentals of chromatography uh, uh, with this. So, with a major focus on um, intermolecular forces of attraction. Okay, so here is essentially the start of this particular lecture. And then we do go through those slides so students understand where their focus is going to be. But um, you know, when I first came uh, to this institution, I was teaching physical chemistry, thermodynamics. And like many of the faculty before me, because I've talked to them, but it's one of those subjects where students um, struggle, they can struggle with it. So a lot of the chemistry students can struggle with it. It's advanced, you know, difficult topics um, that uh, are, you know, some of that content is addressed in gen chem, maybe a little bit of organic, if you have some physical organic uh, content in uh, organic chemistry courses. Uh, but this is when they get it really hard here. They, they use this calculus quite a bit as well. And so students tend to struggle. And you know, what we find is that students you know, just the average student is just trying to get through the course. And so that's pretty difficult because it's challenging material that's not necessarily uh, you know, enthused about the material. So they tend to be rather indifferent about it. And so you, know, you can get these bimodal distributions in PCAM, or you get these very low averages in exams here. You know, and so you know, a curve has to be introduced so that when everybody fails the course or it does poorly, and so, you know, I was noticing this when I, I was teaching this course. And uh, so after the first midterm, when I had this bimodal distribution, I was thinking, what can I do here to help these students on you know, the, the lower uh, end of, of, of this uh, spectrum of grades? And you know, so I was thinking, what, what can we do? How can I make this material relevant to them to engage them and get them excited? Uh, about the material, or at least more interested in it, because it's really hard when you're indifferent about something, or you just don't like something. It's really hard to overcome that indifference or that dislike and do well with it. I mean, it's just natural that we tend to do very well at those things that we're interested in, engaged in, and we like. But really hard to overcome uh, those barriers we put in, in, in front of us um, and do well. So it's really hard. And so, what could I do? And, you know, whether this works or not, I don't know. But this was kind of a motivational talk I gave the students that I'm giving now on the first day when my students are analytical, because the same thing happens. We, the students are traditionally, and I don't tell students this in the course, but traditionally in this course, students struggle. There's a lot of math, uh, contextualized math, uh, but it's a you know, quantum jump above general chemistry. And uh, the complexity of the problems that we're looking at is significantly different. There's no uh, multiple choice or anything like that. And so students can really struggle, struggle. You know, they can use M1, V1, because M2, V2, and it's plug and chug. But when you embed that into a question that's part of a sample preparative method, it's very hard for them to extract that information. And so they really struggle. So what can I do to get you, you know, to, to excited about essentially analytical chemistry and you know, really think more deeply about these problems uh, because I'm not plugging shut at this level. So what I found, and this was a while ago in Pekin, is that there's a light bulb. It has been uh, on since 1908. It's essentially a Texas light bulb. I'd say it's in Texas, in Fort Worth, Texas, and was first switched on in 1908. It's a 40 watt light bulb. And it's been on for a very long time. It's known as the Eternal Light, and it's at the Byers Opera House. And it was installed by a stagehand, uh, Barry Burke, and, on September 21st of 1908, and it's right above the backstage door. And it's been on continuously, except for once, um, when uh, it was turned off by accident before being put on its own in the circuit. Now, it's no longer there because the buyer's office is not there. It was abolished in 77. So it was moved to uh, a museum in the Livestock Exchange building. And if you look at the Livestock Exchange, if you've been there, you can actually see this light bulb that's still lit. Okay. Well, it's been on for 115 years. You know, that's amazing. 115 years for that light bulb. It's a 40 watt light bulb. It's currently not operating at 40 watts, but a 40 watt light bulb. And I was thinking, well, how much energy would it take to keep that light bulb lit for 115 years? And the reason why I chose this is because in the thermo, we're looking at transfer of energy. 
right? We're looking at a movement of energy into and out of systems, maybe the transfer of energy between systems and surroundings. And we're talking about you know, kilojoules per mole for a given reaction. And you know, we use these numbers without really any context. Like, are, are these large numbers, right? Is this a huge amount of energy flowing into or out of chemical systems? And we're talking about this, right? And so it's just one way to think a little bit more deeply about the chemistry that we're looking at, if we can think about in terms of you know, a little deeper level, how much energy is associated with these chemical reactions, right? So can we make this personal? Can we uh, put that uh, the, this energy um, transfer and uh, contextualized in a way that makes it personal to us, makes it more interesting to us? So for the 40 watt light bulb, I multiply that by the number of hours that's been on and convert that to kilowatt hours, which is what we charged uh, by the electric company. Now that's uh, over 40,000 kilowatt hours of electricity. And so you know, how much energy is that overall um, to keep that lit? And so if we do the uh, dimensional analysis, of center, we find that it's essentially 1.5 1 times 10 to the 11th joules of energy. That's what it took to keep that light bulb lit over these 115 years. But great, is that a big number? I don't know, it's not contextualized necessarily, right? If I look at it in terms of the national debt, the size of the national debt, that may be you know, a, a small number, right? You know, so, but if we're looking at it in terms of you know, 10 to the 11th, um, how many days uh, would that be, right? Uh, that's a lot of days, right? A lot of years, a lot of centuries, et cetera. But, so that number doesn't mean a lot to me, it's certainly a lot bigger than kilojoules per mole for a given reaction, but is it big? I don't know. So let's place it in more personalized terms. Okay. And so I was thinking, well, one thing we can do, and there's a video here, uh, you can look at, at this on, it's that 1.45 times 11 joules is equivalent to uh, essentially 33,500 tons of TNT, right? So, uh, if you click on this link right here, you're going to see an explosion with a major shockwave, but that's only for 100 tons of TNT. And so we'd have to multiply that right, by 33 to get the equivalent explosion associated with you know, the amount of energy um, that you have to heat that light bulb. But, and so this is massive. So you can look this up, just type that into the, the search term uh, on Google um, or YouTube. And you know, it's, it's pretty impressive, but you know, that's an instantaneous release of that energy. So of course it's gonna be impressive. It's a lot of energy, uh, presumably, right? So let's look at it in terms of you know, day to day, how much energy do it take to keep that light bulb work in any given day? And so I was thinking, what could I use to put that in terms I can understand? And so I came up with a bacon and cheese biscuit. So back in, you know, in the early 2000s, I like bacon and cheese biscuits, right? So you, know, you gotta look at that, right? It's, a, it's an overcooked egg, greasy bacon, the finest American cheese on a dried out biscuit. You know, what could be better than that? And somehow it all works when you put it all together like that. And it's like nature's most perfect food. But individually, mm. yeah, but together, it's amazing. And so I was thinking, well, how many of these bacon and cheese biscuits would I have to eat to equal the amount of energy, to consume the same amount of energy to keep that food like that. Okay, well, bacon and cheese biscuit is about 400 nutritional calories, okay? And since a nutritional calorie was uh, equal to a thousand thermal calories, it would essentially be 400,000 thermal calories per bacon and cheese biscuit, or one and a half million joules. That's how much energy you're consuming. Great, right. so how many bacon and cheese biscuits would I have to eat to consume the same amount of energy, 1.45 times 10 to the joules, that it took to keep that light bulb lit. Well, it comes out to over 86,000 bacon and cheese biscuits. That seems like a lot, but if I break it down to a daily basis, that's only two per day. Huh. Two per day, right? So if I were to essentially eat two per day, so one, essentially every 12 hours, I could keep a 40 watt light bulb lit. Awesome. Okay. So two bacon and cheese biscuits equals the same amount of energy it takes to keep that light bulb lit for 24 hours. Well, I could do that, no problem. But you know, that was like 20 years ago. 
And today, if I were to eat two bacon and cheese biscuits, uh, I'd be gaining a lot of weight. That's just something my metabolism can't handle. And since I don't have a 40 watt light bulb attached to my head, I'd be gaining weight. So maybe I can put in some other terms here, right? Maybe I, there's some other activity I can do besides eating uh, at McDonald's. Maybe there's something else I could do to burn off or to consume that same amount of energy as in a bacon and cheese biscuit. So rather than gain weight, maybe I could go to the gym. And so I have this right here. I won't actually uh, take off the screen share. So I usually take this weight into the, into the classroom and say, well, you know, I could go to the gym. And you know, maybe I could calculate how many curls I would have to do to burn off the same amount of energy in one bacon and cheese biscuit. This way, if I, since I don't have a 40 watt light bulb, I could burn that off and not gain weight. So um, my calculation assumes a 100 pound weight because that's what I use at home. Uh, so it's essentially how many curls, essentially lifting up, just assuming it only takes energy to lift and nothing to bring down, okay? How many curls would I have to do with a 100 pound weight? to equal the same amount of energy in a single bacon and cheese biscuit. But we're just using MGH, okay? That's the amount of energy it'll take to raise 100 pounds. And I, I assumed essentially a third of a meter, or so a foot. It's probably a little bit more than that, but essentially how much energy to raise 100 pound weight a foot in the air. Now what it comes out to is there's about 136 joules per rep to do that. And so I would have to do over 12,000 curls to essentially uh, burn off the same amount of energy in a single bacon and cheese biscuit. Wow. That's a lot of energy, right? And that's huge. And that's really kind of amazing to think that there's so much energy packed into one of those uh, 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 biscuits, uh, biscuit sandwiches. That's a lot, right? And it also points out to the fact that, that your body is an amazing machine. The amount of energy it requires to maintain homeostasis is incredible. Because you're consuming a lot more calories per day than in a single bacon and cheese biscuit. So this is what makes it kind of a, a little bit more sobering for me in terms of the amount of energy we're talking about in these types of chemical reactions. It's significant. Okay? All right. So the problem is, I still love bacon and cheese biscuits back in the day. Probably still do, but I stay away from them. And I'm not going to do over 12,000 reps with 100 pound weight. So what could I do instead if I want to eat those bacon and cheese biscuits? Is there another way to burn off that energy? And so I was thinking, well, <laughs> well that's not doable, uh, but maybe there's an easier solution. And maybe that is in my freezer, right? And, and what the answer might be would be eating ice, right? So if I were to eat ice, and I'll just say it's at zero degrees Celsius, well, it takes energy to essentially at zero degrees Celsius to convert that ice to water. And then it takes energy to raise the temperature of that water from zero to 37 degrees, which is body temperature. So both of those steps require energy. And that comes out to about 484 joules per gram of ice. And so all I would have to do is eat about seven, uh, over seven and a half pounds of ice. So if I eat one bacon and cheese biscuit, all I'd have to do is uh, eat 7.7 uh, .7 pounds of ice to burn off the amount of energy I consume eating that bacon and cheese biscuit. Awesome. The only problem with that is if I'm going to be doing that, I'm going to have a bacon and cheese biscuit in one hand and a ball of ice in another, and I'll be tied to the bathroom again. Right. So, you know, these, these calculations, I know there are issues associated with some of these calculations, et cetera. But, but the point is, is that we're trying to contextualize and make it a little bit more personal for the students. You know, I can only do so much. They have to become more than half right and be engaged and try to be engaged. But they need some way to make the, these equations, these numbers that we're dealing with all the time personal, right? So that they can, uh, they don't, they're not sitting there indifferent or disliking it, and so that they can actually come away with important information that they will use in future courses and in their career as well. So and that's, that's what's at stake here. Okay, so why, you know, why all of this? And the goal here is that, you know, I tell students is that there's a lot of students who graduate each year 
number of degrees. So this is from 2009. I can't find any information from the ACS website. But essentially, you know, about 40% of the students uh, of these 1,400,000 know, continue on into MS and PhD programs. And that means 60% are going into industry. Uh, or, you know, some fraction will be going into professional schools as well. So you know, med school, pharmacy, dental, uh, et cetera. Uh, but it's a smaller fraction overall than uh, the graduate school or, or industry. And, you know, it's competitive, right? So uh, if you want to go into graduate school, you want to go into the graduate school of your choice, right? You might have a top five, but you want to be able to get into those programs. You want to be competitive. And once you're there, you want to, you know, work for the faculty member that most interests you. And that can be competitive as well because they can only accept so many students into the research groups. And there's a lot of jobs in industry that are just horrible jobs, right? Chemistry jobs that are just bench jobs or boring, nothing exciting, nothing challenging about them. And you don't want those jobs. You want to be competitive for the best jobs in the industry that are paying well and that are challenging to you and make you grow uh, as a person and a professional. And so you want to be competitive. And so Every course is important. It's important to come away with information, usable information, information that you can use in every course. Now, uh, a colleague of mine and, and, and I have been interviewing companies for a very long time, for over 20 years. And you know, so based on our questions uh, that we've asked these companies and industry partners over you know, the 20 year period, these are the top qualifications or skills that they're looking for. You know, and you know, it's, it's related to the companies we're interviewing, right? It may not be universal, maybe different for a local company where you are, but the goal here is that this is in, uh, what's important to those companies and industry representatives that we have interviewing and, and speaking with. And the number one skill is the ability to apply knowledge and skills to real world settings, right? So having some fundamental right, knowledge base and be able to use that knowledge base in an insightful way. I mean, that's what we're asking, right? So a company's not hiring you to give them answers to problems they solved a long time ago. They're asking you to give them solutions to problems they don't even know exist, right? Or have, have not thought to ask yet, right? I mean, that's the ideal. And so somewhere in between, but they want you to be able to have some facility with the knowledge you've gained. And of course, everyone wants you to be able to effectively communicate both in oral and written formats. They want you to be able to work in teams as well as individually. They want you certainly to be safe, um, protective of your own health and welfare, but also the health and welfare of, uh, of your colleagues working uh, in the same uh, lab space, et cetera. And of course, they want you to have a set of ethics and, and, and act accordingly uh, with that set of ethics, no doubt. Uh, but, you know, Having some fundamental knowledge, of course, they're going to teach you what you need to know. But you know, going in there, being able to speak intelligently about your experiences, uh, whether it's at undergraduate research or in your courses, right? That's going to set you apart. Someone who can't speak intelligently about what they, their last four years have been in school uh, isn't going to come across that way. So you want to be able to speak the language of the industry, have some knowledge, and, and, and be able to essentially show that you have some knowledge and that you can think on your feet a little bit. You should be able to after four years of college. Okay, and there's one other thing because I'm an analytical chemist. Uh, you know, part of my uh, program is essentially building instruments. You know, I have students build instruments from scratch, et cetera, is that uh, essentially the ability to modify, troubleshoot, and maintain instrumentation is highly valued, but it's a skill lacking essentially all undergraduates. I mean, you know, industry doesn't even expect this anymore. But if you ask them, yes, we would love to have students who know something about the chemical instrumentation that they'll be exposed to. I mean, we'll teach them, but you know, the problem is, is that none of them know anything because really the, the experience has been put a sample into an instrument, get a result. There's no fine tuning, no method development, no validation, no experience doing that whatsoever. Everything's pre-optimized, pre-configured for them. And you know, in many cases, there are programs where students don't even get access to the instrumentation. They provide a sample to their TA, and you know the TA gives them an already uh, uh, result, you know, an NMR, an IR result, et cetera, uh, that's already been essentially developed and, and given to them. Uh, and so the students don't even know if their samples are truly uh, 
pure or, or, or whatever it is that they've, they've made. And, and so, you know, it's unfortunate that you know, we have different strengths and we have different weaknesses in the individual programs. But, you know, so access to instrumentation and hands-on, extensive hands-on access uh, is not very, it's not huge in your classes. And when I say extensive hands-on, I mean actually using the instruments, developing them, because often there's no methods and so on. So it's more likely a student's going to get that exposure in undergraduate research than they are in undergraduate courses. And so our goal here is for our classes is to see if we can do that. And you know, for my 400 level classes, so that's kind of a plug for my 400 level classes, this is what the students are going to be doing. So um, I wanted to point out that in you know, my class is an example problem here in electrochemistry uh, that is, uh, you know, uh, could be on an exam. Uh, and so, you know, I give an hour and a half long exams, or an hour and 50 minute long exams, there's eight questions like this. And so these are substantial questions. And so I want to prepare the students that way. Just sitting here being different about the material isn't going to help you. You need to engage somehow. Because if you don't engage, a question like this is uh, going to be an exceptional challenge. Whereas if you're engaged, this question is actually relatively straightforward. So I use this as an example because it's quite different than anything we've seen in general chemistry, but to give them an idea that let's find some common ground and all of the engaged, let's lean into this course and really take something away from it because we're gonna, there's gonna be a huge benefit if we do. Okay, great. So, uh, and you know, part of this I tell students that you know, my exams, uh, I test the students about to use core concept principles and straightforward that application. So these are known as plug and chug. Uh, but the exams also test your ability to, uh, to use your knowledge and your chemistry and cycling to solve new and novel questions like the one before. And so you know an A or B um, in the course depends on how well you do number two. Right? Uh, C and lower uh, is really based on your ability to do number one. I'm not trying to square student. I'm just trying to tell them if we engage, it's going to come. It's going to come. We're going to help you get there. But if you're just going to sit back and not engage the material, not engage the course, not engage the instructors and the resources, you're going to struggle with that. And so, but it's going to come easy. And you can see the patterns to how to solve problems that by the fifth week, it's going to be nothing I can throw at you. It's going to be too difficult. Okay. And I start out with this in part. So, you know, these analytical reasoning questions used to be in all of the uh, standardized uh, exams for a long period of time, like PSATs, SATs, ACTs, um, general GRE, uh, LSAT, MCAT, et cetera. So there's only one exam that actually contains, still has these types of questions. That's the LSAT. LSAT still has these types of analytical reasoning. And, you know, it's unfortunate because these are the only questions that really measure a student's ability to read through and reason out the solution to a given set of information. Right? The rest of it's really just all plug and chug and memory. And so all of these standardized exams no longer test a student's critical thinking skills, um, which is why oftentimes, right, we, we have found here that the GRE, graduate GRE, has no bearing on whether a student is successful in a uh, PhD program there's no bearing that's well because it doesn't test their critical thinking skills. Right? So I try and tell students we need to approach our problems like these problems. And so they actually go through this. This is an activity we have in the lecture uh, where they go through. Now here I give them multiple choice, A, B, C, D, and E. Now my questions on exams or in, in workshops um, don't have A, B, C, D. There's no multiple choice. So you can't reason it out based on just going through the list and finding out which one works. Um, that you have to trust your ability to reason through to come up with that right answer. Okay. So anyway, just an example question. Okay. We're going to go through this, uh, past this here. Um, and so uh, we do, uh, and, and so this is methods of quantitation, the problem that we look at in methods of quantitation. We're not quite there yet, but the goal here is for part of this first lecture is for them to essentially develop a graphical method see if you can tease out the information here and essentially make an, 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 a figure, right? 
a representative of the word code. Because if you can do that, then the numbers just fall out. Then the mathematical expression just falls out. If you can essentially, you know, so we teach this over and over and over, don't just read this thing, map it out, develop a workflow. And that workflow will tell you the map. It will give you the map and you get the answer correct every time. And that's what we're trying to stress on this. It's analytical reasoning. Okay, so one of the things here uh, in our uh, curriculum is that uh, we look at uh, the intro courses and the capstone courses, et cetera. Uh, the analytical sequence begins with Q227, which is this course. Then uh, if students decide, they can take 423, 425. 423 is an instrumental course in spectroscopy. 425 is electrochemistry and chromatography. Uh, and so that's the sequence. If they're, if they're engaged in that, excited enough in chemistry, these are the next courses to take. And in 423, uh, we do project-based labs. We do a number of things because, you know, we also build instruments as well. Uh, but some of the um, more recent things that we've done um, in these courses here, and this course just an advertisement for these students maybe have been engaged a little bit in that work we've done uh, in these 400 level courses. Okay. So uh, in electronics, uh, you know, we look at this in a modular way. And actually, this is a figure from uh, a friend of mine from a long time ago. Uh, shout out to Matt. For a cycle of talent, now uh, we have built our own cycle of talent as we have circuit diagrams, so, but this is a, a nice uh, compact view of what a circuit looks like for a cycle of talent. And you can compare that to one that we've published uh, in papers on in uh, JK um, But uh, you know, we look at electronics in these courses in, in a modular format. So our goal here is that students uh, within uh, the electronics component, which is taught over four weeks, and then by that time, after the four weeks, are actually ready to start building their own instruments with mentorship and guidance, et cetera. But the goal here is that within the first two weeks, they're playing with very simple circuits that involve RLC and op amps, uh, transistors and diodes. Uh, in the third week, they build a mini spectrophotometer and couple that to an A to D converter um, so they get a digital readout and they compare their measurement on um, this mini spectrophotometer that they just built on the, on the desktop, uh, sorry, on the bench top, uh, to a commercial instrument, find out that they can see it. Then in the fourth week, we build an AM radio. And the AM radio encompasses everything we've talked about in the first three weeks of electronics. And uh, by the end of that, they can explain how the AM radio works. And then from that, then essentially every instrument we build or have been built as part of a semester long project and incorporates all of those components. And so we really, in a very quick uh, time frame, within four weeks, we are actually fairly knowledgeable about how electronics and can start designing the circuits, which we help them tweak and essentially. Okay, so this is the spectrometer, this is the radio, um, it's like multimeter. So this is our circuit for the cycle multimeter that actually uses a programmable chip, um, but you can see that. So, and so this is the goal here, is to get students interested. Uh, the NMR, uh, we have students build an NMR probe. Uh, we don't do it that often because it is expensive uh, for me to do this. These other uh, instrument building like cycle multimeter, less than $50. This actually costs me $1,500 for the students to make. And part of that is the machine shop time. So they go to engineering services and they, those guys, We'll teach them how to develop AutoCAD because they have to develop the AutoCAD uh, files for all of these. They'll show them how to uh, run the uh, computer driven lathe and in and stuff like that. So it's not just chemistry, but the students are getting full experience on how to build uh, some type of device uh, besides just soldering components together. And, uh, so you can see for that probe that we built that sits right up into a 400 megahertz bunker instrument. Right, we were able to tune to seven different nuclei by placing in the appropriate uh, conductor. So we've done GCFIDs, ultrasonic levitator, which we use uh, to calculate the nodes and standing waves, and then compare that to essentially the optical uh, resonators with a uh, Heaney laser. And, but you can see that this, this uh, Smile Student Publications, all of these where students have built uh, instruments as part of the courses that I teach. Uh, now, of course, 
they build, start building these instruments, we need to characterize them more so that the Williams will need to pay for the need to do, do research with the extra semester so we can really fully characterize these instruments. Because by the end of the semester, they built it. We've done some simple comparisons and, and, and characterization, but they need to do more complete. Okay, and we have a few more as well. The accepted is uh, actually is, uh, has been published as well. Uh, we also you know, have worked with a number of other uh, institutions and uh, organizations where we've donated these instruments or they've built these instruments, we provided tech support, et cetera. So it's actually the SMILE initiative, Small Mobile Instruments for Laboratory Enhancement, uh, has been beneficial for other uh, institutions and organizations. And so you know, I'm happy to be a part of uh, helping these institutions uh, incorporate some instrument building or home built instruments into their program. Uh, so we also uh, work with industry to do a lot of collaborating as well. So all work is performed by students in these courses. Um, and so we have uh, worked with a number of different institutions and agencies and organizations uh, to uh, uh, conduct some uh, consulting work for them. Uh, so again, a partial list of companies as well. So our students are getting some real world experience, not just an academic uh, exposure to these concepts, et cetera, but also some real world exposure to the problems that are facing these institutions and agencies today. Okay, so I know that that was a lot. Let's see if I can save. To save, but hopefully, screen sharing stuff, that's great. So, hopefully, you have an idea of essentially the, some of the things that we do. This is in part encapsulates my first lecture. I've gone into some additional detail that I don't with the students, etc. Uh, but part of it is a cell for the 400 other courses because the students have an option not to take my spectroscopy course uh, and they can take something else. Uh, you know, but the goal is that there's a lot of work associated with that, but what you're doing is pretty amazing. Uh, and hopefully they, they get stimulated by that and hopefully that engages them in the 227 course so that they will want to take that 400 other course okay all right so that's the first lecture um the next one will be methods of quantitation because that'll be the first lecture that we uh, go over uh, in the course and uh again remember uh, those uh, you're missing, you know, those things that we have students do these calculations in real time in the course, so it slows me down a little bit. Um, so I don't cover probably as much in the PowerPoint because the PowerPoints probably go over and have enough slides to go over two or three lectures. Uh, so you know, there's only a subset of them that I actually discuss in any one lecture. I might be moving through them a little bit faster um, than I normally would because you know, we're interacting with students so that I'm not just standing up there talking all the time, but we're working through problems together, et cetera. And there are days when we just work on problems that we're not going to be videotaping or anything like that. Okay. All right. So take care and I'll see you in the next video. If I can find the record button.